Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you may be joining us today. Uh, my name is Khaira Noor, the chairperson of the ELS Sports Law Committee. Um, I'm delighted to welcome each one of you to our webinar on a truly transformative and captivating intersection in the topic of artificial intelligence and sports, emerging trends, opportunities, legal and ethical considerations in practice. In recent times, we've witnessed a remarkable evolution in the way technology, particularly AI, has permeated various facets of our lives. Today, we gather to explore the fascinating realm where AI meets the world of sports. This juncture is not merely a convergence of disparate uh, fields, but a rather harmonious blend, promising unparalleled advancements and new possibilities. As we delve into the heart of our discussion, we will navigate through the latest trends that AI has introduced to the sports landscape, from performance analytics and injury prevention to the fan engagement and beyond, the impact of AI is multifaceted and promises to redefine the very nature of sports as we know it. Moreover, our esteemed panels, panel of experts will shed light on the vast opportunities AI presents for athletes, coaches, sports organization, and even enthusiasts. The use of AI in training, strategy development, and even in the enhancement of the overall fan experience marks the dawn of a new era in sports innovation. However, with great power comes great responsibility. We cannot overlook the legal and ethical considerations that accompany the integration of AI into sports. Our discussion will encompass the delicate balance required to ensure fair play, data privacy, and ethical use of AI technology in the sports domain. Before we commence our insightful conversation, I extend my heartfelt uh, gratitude to our distinguished panelists, experts in the field, who have graciously agreed to share their knowledge and experience with us today. Their perspectives will undoubtedly enrich our understanding of this dynamic landscape. And to our audience, I encourage you to actively engage in the discussion, ask questions, and contribute to the dialogue. Your insights and curiosity are integral to the success of the webinar. Once again, welcome to our session, and let the exploration begin. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll hand over to my vice chair, Mr. Philip Munabi, who is the co-moderator for this session today. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you, Chair, for, for the wonderful introduction. I hope I can be heard. Uh, I think all has been said. My role today is to introduce the distinguished panelists. We have a panel session from Nigeria, two panelists from Nigeria, Tanzania, uh, Kenya. I have worked with most of these panelists, and I know they are very good and passionate about the topic we are handling today. Uh, our first panelist will be our first panelist will be Dr. Emmanuel. Will be Dr. Emmanuel Olowomi Olufawemi, who is a holder of a PhD, LLM, BL, legal practitioner, sports dispute arbitrator, notary public of the Supreme Court of Nigeria, of the Supreme Court of Nigeria, and a writer, passionate writer about sports law. I, one of my favorite writings is his paper to his paper in the uh, Cavendi University Law Journal. Uh, one of the recent papers is the 2023, 2023 paper still on artificial intelligence in sports. Uh, we also have Mr. Atata, who is a partner at Holbach Law Firm, Nigeria. The former chair International Bar Association or uh, the Africa Regional Forum. Uh, I've also worked with him at Courtroom Mail 100, uh, a very big network for law firms and lawyers across Africa. We have Mr. Peter Mashkirwa. He has just recently been in Uganda, uh, championing the cause of uh, esports. I've also worked with him before on the esports webinar by ULS. Uh, we have Mr. Timothy Kaja, who is an associate at KTA, advocates, and also a lecturer at uh, Chambogo University and uh, UCU. Uh, we shall have on panel also uh, Aisha Abdallah, who is the head dispute resolution at ALN Africa. She is so passionate about this area. Last year, she hosted us for a session on navigating sports law, na navigating your career in sports law. 
which was attended widely by so many advocates in Kenya and uh, students who have, who have passion about this area of practice. Uh, maybe before I get a call to welcome Dr. Emmanuel, we have had a few highlights and breakthroughs. We have recently about uh, on second, the High Court here gave a very distinguished and detailed landmark judgment on image rights in sports law. It has been discussed widely on social media platforms and mainstream media. It's the first of its kind to, to discuss what image rights for sportsmen include, what their value would be, and what it is for what it means for them. And uh, the sports subsector in Uganda will be very blessed with this decision. So, so I'll welcome Dr. Emmanuel who is going to handle the impact of artificial intelligence in sports law globally and also forecast on what the future holds for sports law practitioners in this field. Thank you. Dr. Emmanuel? Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon like to you. How is Nigeria? Fine, thank you. I want to visit Kalakuta Republic. <laughs> that is in Lagos. I'm at Abuja at the Federal Capital Territory. Sure. I want to welcome you to the to the members who are on call across Africa. They are distinguished law practitioners, journalists who would want to know and understand the impact of IA in sports. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, uh, uh, the chair, Percy. Um, the vice chairman Uh, Phil, I, I I think we've lost. And at this juncture, I, I would like uh, to hand over back to Phil. Doctor? I see doctor is joining. Thank you, doctor. It's good. Oh, yeah, I think I'm back now. Can you all hear me? Yes, we are able to hear you now. Okay, so sorry, please. Uh, I was shut out, but I, I'm happy to be back. As I was saying, I like to appreciate the platform given to me to share of my view in respect of the topic we are considering here today, talking about artificial intelligence and sport, emerging trend, the opportunity, the legal and ethical consideration in practice. I have tried to uh, put my thoughts together and created uh, a slide of the same, which I have shared already with um, Mr. Gabriel, who have really been uh, in touch in respect of this program. Thank you, Mr. Gabriel. Uh, I started by looking at 
the lesson outcomes and objectives seek to achieve by this presentation. Uh, number one, to understand the impact of artificial intelligence in the sport industry. And number two, to identify the four major impact of artificial intelligence or the dimensions of artificial intelligence in the sport industry. And then I will, number three, take a look at the various interventions of artificial intelligence in the sport industry, as well as the recent practical applications or usefulness of artificial intelligence in the sport. Uh, and that will as well just be as latest as the match play yesterday between the uh, the Igu, the Super Igu of Nigeria and the Bafana Bafana of South Africa, where the referee at every uh, at some critical moment in the course of the match needed to revert back to the van uh, to get his decision correctly, and you and I we agree that some of those decisions, not for the artificial intelligence, talking about the assisted, assisted referee uh, video recording, uh, it will have gone the other way. For instance, there was a point at which the super ego thought they were two goals up and they suddenly have to return back to uh, one one. So it, it, the goals was not just removed. A penalty was awarded on the other side and the, the match was back to one one. All right, sport can be categorized as um, a lecture activity. So it was at the beginning that people consider uh, sport as a recreational activity, a pastime activity. But over the year, sport have grown from being just a mere recreational activity to a super industry of multi-billion uh, multi-billion dollars industry that the competition today uh, is hiding. So sport now a day is now beyond uh, things of mere pride, a pastime or just entertainment. It is now a multi-billion dollar industry exceedingly commercialized, highly competitive and lucrative enterprise. All right. And let me, so today we talk about sport from the angle of commercial, uh, we, we talk about sport, not just as a pastime or a recreation activity, but a highly commercialized uh, enterprise. The sport industry is not isolated and is not insulated from the realities of the society. Earlier before now, when the first move of bringing artificial intelligence into the sport industry was muted. Uh, a lot of people spoke against it uh, because they believe that the controversy in the sport is part of the game. In other words, what makes uh, football sweet, people, footballers will say, or football fans will say, are the controversial decisions of the referees that is talked about after the end of the game. Maybe a penalty was supposed to be awarded, it was not awarded, and all that. So people believe that these controversial issues are the things that make a sport sport. In other words, you see it in the highlight of the news in the morning. So the next day, the news newspapers are carrying it, all media houses are talking about it. That the so much talk about after the end of the game is what makes sport sweet. But over time, this argument has been jettisoned and the sport industry, like other industries, have been open to the inflow and influence of artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence, otherwise known as AI, is a term used in technology to refer to machines which are capable of cognitive capabilities, uh, ability to, uh, to mimic human beings, ability to assist human beings uh, or ability to automate, to operate as automated machine. Uh, the ideas of artificial intelligence is not really very new. As far back as 1955, it was said that John Makata, also known as the father of AI, coined the word artificial intelligence 
during a conference organized. So as far back as 1955, the world has been conscious of artificial intelligence. But just like I said, the sport industry initially uh, was resistance to the inflows of, of artificial intelligence uh, uh, in, in, in the sport industry. It was believed that there can never be a perfect officiating and that no attempt should even be made for perfect officiating, like I said, because the controversies, the, the controversial decisions that, that happen in the course of the game is what made the game sweet as people are able to debate. I'm talking about it for years thereafter. But eventually, uh, the sport industry has welcomed the influence and influence and influence of artificial intelligence. Now, artificial intelligence works in four ways, and these four ways are also applicable before in the sport industry. Number one, it may be as an automated intelligence, automated intelligence. It may be in form of assistance intelligence, like what we have in video referee, assisting the referee to review a decision, to see, to have a second, a second chance of looking at the incident um, so that he could make, you know, an incident happen in the, on the field of play. There is no opportunity for the referee to have a second look at the incident. And yet he must decide one way or the other whether to avoid the penalty kick or not, whether to disallow the goal or not, or whether it's an offside call or not, and so also to in other sport activities. Now, what happened with artificial intelligence is that it assists the referee to be able to have a second look, uh, a, a second look and be able to come up with a decision. Then we have the augmented intelligence and we have the autonomous intelligence. Quickly, are we examining, which is the call of my paper this morning, are we examining the various interventions of artificial intelligence in the sport industry? In doing this, I've highlighted 10 areas uh, in, which the, in which artificial intelligence have actually, over the year, intervened in the sport industry. Number one is in respect of training. Today, artificial intelligence is massively used in the sport industry for training. So uh, players are exposed to, uh, uh, to techniques. Player, players are able to prepare uh, going through uh, certain information made available by reasons of artificial intelligence. Players are able to prepare and predict the likelihood. For instance, it is possible now by reasons of artificial intelligence to predict how a particular player normally play his penalty kick. Does he play the ball to the right? Does he play to the left? Or does he aim for the center of the post? It is possible for you to know this by, uh, by, by artificial intelligence and then be able to prepare accordingly. So training has been one massive area that artificial intelligence have come to be in the sport industry. Number two, uh, monitoring for doping. Uh, it is said that the sport industry believes so much in equality and equity and a fair play. So nobody should be nobody should be at an advantage, as it were, when competing in a sport by reasons of use of enhancement and drug. And the 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 campaign for um, drug free competition uh, competition in sport industry. It's not just because of that also, it's also because of the health implication on the participants that in an attempt to uh, engage in sport, we should not have people dying or exposed to health challenges as a result of consumption of substances believed to be able to enhance ability. Today, now in those days, it was difficult to monitor effectively and accurately uh, people who may have taken uh, substances believed to enhance abilities and uh, ensure um, agility, as it were, in the field of play. But today, with artificial intelligence, monitoring of for doping have been made a lot easier. So it's already assistance in WADA in monitoring of doping. Even the use of modern-day uh, workable gadgets to, to, to locate and to determine culprit. Number four, 
Artificial intelligence have been helpful in avoidance of injury. Artificial intelligence have been helpful in avoidance of injury. This is because AI has capacity to predict, to predict and to assist and to predict of uh, damages and to predict with uh, with an excess of accuracy uh, the likelihood of uh, certain damages occurring or injuries sustained uh, in the course of particular uh, 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 participation in particular sport if certain things are not avoided. is also able to give a history, a history of, uh, of injury uh, that have happened in a particular sport uh, or, or an event. Number five, AI have also helped a lot in respect of assisting referee. Now, this is one area of artificial intelligent intervention in the sport industry that is known to everybody, especially for those who follow the game of football. Because today we have assistance, assistance uh, referee videoing. Uh, the assistance referee videoing uh, is made available uh, by the field of play, and particularly in the football, uh, it, there was a, a reluctancy, there was an opposition, there was a refusal to allow assisted refereeing video uh, in the game of football because, like I said, some people believe that it will diminish or it will dis demystify uh, the game of football and the controversies uh, which are, people believe are the catalysts for for the uh, for the attentions and attractions to the game of football we we diminish but over the year uh, fifa welcome uh, artificial intelligence and then uefa uh, welcome artificial intelligence and virtually uh, all the continent are followed through and today even us in in the even us uh, in the game of football in the continent of africa uh, also follow through with assistance referee video. And just like I said, by way of introduction, when I was commencing my presentation, not for the not for the AI intervention in the match of yesterday, one will be correct to say that the match might likely have ended as 2-0. And then there will have been no need for extra time not to talk of penalty kick. But you will agree with me that the ref uh, the, the referee uh, the referee was very correct with his decision to award a penalty kick to the Bafana Bafana upon, upon having a, a reshow of the incident that happened in the 18-yard box of Nigeria in the build-up to the goal scored by the current Africa best player, uh, Victor Osimen. So that is what we are saying. And that is all thanks to artificial intelligence. In the days where artificial intelligence was not allowed into the sport industry, the game yesterday will most likely have ended as 2-0. So that is what we are saying. So today, the accuracy, the occasional accuracy of, of refereeing in the game of football since the advent of VAR have actually increased phenomenal. And there is a massive improvement. And so FIFA has recounted that the entire replacement of human beings with robots may arise in the nearest future uh well we don't know but it is hinted that a time will come that perhaps maybe it is robot who, that will be officiating matches but now uh, but at this moment the assistance uh interventions of artificial intelligence in the game of football like in ruby as well as a, and also in law tennis have been a welcome development i go to point six broadcasting and streaming that also have been made uh, fantastic and reachable uh, to all by way of uh, artificial intelligence. Number seven, scoutings and recruiting of players. Scoutings and recruiting of players have also been made uh, possible or helped or improved by the interventions of artificial intelligence. Number eight, predictions of scores. AM. Uh, uh, has grown to a point that it can, it can, it can predict what will be the score of a particular game, and some of these uh, predictions have been held to be accurate 
because AI is, is able to process the history between the two teams or between the participating teams and then uh, look at one or two things and then come up with a prediction. For instance, many analysts agreed or predicted before the match yesterday uh, that based on the uh, on the superior head uh, on the superior head to head record of um of uh the super eagle with south africa especially in uh, in afcon uh that the super eagle uh, is expected to come out victoriously so they they anchor their prediction based on the statistic available and this also is what we are saying that ai could also analyze a match and come up with a, a prediction. And this prediction have been found to be accurate to an extent. Uh, AI gather analyzed data based on various factors, such as the quantity of passes made between teammates, chances generated, and passes resulted in goal scoring opportunity using a computer uh, vision, and then be able to predict what would be the outcome of the match. The outcome of the upcoming matches is therefore predicted by AI using that knowledge and data that have been processed. And uh, this, of course, has had uh, 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 an implication in, uh, on the betting industry. And uh, I believe when it is time for us to, um, uh, to consider the ethical and the legal implications or considerations of the uh, impact of artificial intelligence in the sport industry, we will do so. Number nine. Uh, personalized trainings and advanced diet plans. AI can provide athletes with individualized training and diet plans thanks to machine learning and deep learning uh, ag aggregating. And for instance, AI diet can plan various meals for player for different purposes. When a player is recovering, he can AI can specify the type of uh, diet food to be true. Then number 10, uh, AI have enhanced and give to give today better fans engagement. Fans have been able to get uh, a better um, a better enjoyment uh, uh, and the, the, the recreational aspect of sport all thanks to AI. Then number 11 is ticketing, ticketing. AI today we have automated ticketing in the game of in the in, in the sport industry in those days uh people having to queue up to pay to to assess the venue of a match or a tournament uh or, was quite hectic and this discouraged a lot of people from participating as a fan but today ai have made it very easy for people to participate for people to buy tickets for people to participate and have access uh, to matches play easily without the stress. I will mention number 12 um, overview of interventions of AI in the sport industry, uh, which is, of course, interesting to our colleague in as journalists, uh, especially as sport journalists. For the sport, for the for sport journalism, the AI work as an automa uh, automated uh, uh, intelligence to help when reporting on sport news, which is crucial. Uh, games, the uh, sport industry is lucrative. Sport industry is sweet. Sport industry is uh, is where it is today by reasons of media scrutiny and the media attention that have been on it. So the media, the media, really have played a very significant role in bringing. So in, in bringing to 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 the current to the current position that we are in with the sport industry, the glamours of the sport industry is not unconnected with media. So media people have really done a lot. One thing about artificial intelligence in respect of sport journalism is that uh, artificial intelligence enable um, journalists to to generate news for journalists covering this in a short amount of time, 
It could be difficult, but today it's possible for a journalist to cover all the matches that are simultaneously played by reasons of artificial intelligence. In fact, it is possible for a journalist to stay in the comfort of his house and put all the matches going on simultaneously on a board and be able to know exactly the updates in each of the match that in, in all the matches that are playing simultaneously and give updates to his or her order. That is that so much important. That is that so much of benefit. Therefore, to lessen work, heavy workload, uh, uh, artificial intelligence both are used to track numerous events and writing match report, as well as provide precise data and statistics. For instance, automated artificial intelligence insight provide um, uh, raw data into which narrative through the use of natural uh, language processing can be used by sport journalists to report back to people. And not only that, a sport, man can, a sport journalist can generate a write-up on the report of a match using artificial intelligence. All right, as I begin to wrap up my presentation, uh, other, other interventions, specific interventions uh, include the, 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 the artificial intelligence massively deployed at the last World Cup tournament held in Qatar, that even the football, even the football, uh, the, the, the ball, the ball, uh, the ball were, were, were made with sensors, um, uh, Adidas uh, having to use a lot of sensor on the ball itself that enable uh, a lot of predictions. And this is common today. You have board being, being censored. You have the boot of the player being censored that enable us to know the numbers of time a player touched the ball on the feet of play. So it can tell us accurately that so also player have made 100 passes because the boot has a sensor or the ball has a sensor connected with that particular player. And some of these issues have also been argued in respect of the health implications and what have you. But like I said, uh, there are presenters here today that are going to present to us on the ethical and legal consideration of some of these things. But my own is to just present to us as to how far artificial intelligence have been in the sport industry. So today we have the shoes of the player, the boot of the player connected. We have the go post. We have the line the, the line across the field of play being sensor to capture information. We have the chat board and we have televisions around the field of play. So much interventions in the sport industry by reasons of artificial intelligence. And contrary to the fear earlier that uh, the interventions of artificial intelligence in the sport industry will reduce the entertainment and the controversies and what have you, this seems not to have been the case, uh, as usual, especially for the game of rugby, game of football, uh, cricket. The controversies are still there. The discussions are still there. The attractions are still there. I may conclude, therefore, um, I may therefore conclude that sport artificial intelligence offer a variety of blessings to sport, such as capacity building, entertainment, refereeing, training, tracking for doping, and damage prevention among different matters. However, there are risks associated with the interventions of AI in the sport industry. Therefore, there is the need for a legal and ethical consideration for maximization of artificial intelligence in the sport industry. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being part of this my presentation and be part of this webinar. May I thank one more time again the organizer for the privilege to share in this webinar program and being given the platform to make my contribution. I thank every one of you for listening and to God be the glory. Thank you, thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. It's been a wonderful presentation. Uh, maybe when you, as you come back later, please take, just take a slight note of, uh, you have written in one of your papers that two dangers of uh, of uh, IA in sports is a uh, manipulation of athletes and opposition. Kindly take note of that somewhere. In the later part of the session, you'll 
come out and highlight that. Uh, okay, thank you. Yes, Doctor. Now I'll call on I'll I'll invite on call uh Mr. Atata, <laughs> who is also from Nigeria. We are coming from the north as we come to the east. Mm -hmm. uh, I recognize the presence of uh, Aisha Abdallah, head dispute resolution. She will also be taking us through a very nice session on disputes that may arise. We should all be aware that uh, the EU parliament is coining uh, what would be the first AI act. So she will be of very much use and purpose in that area of discussion. Mr. Atata, if you're on call. Kindly join in. So we can hear the legal and ethical considerations of artificial intelligence in sports. Hello, Philip. Thank you very yes, much. Mr. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you very well. We've always worked this way. We okay. have not met physically, but I know yes. we have always worked this way. Yes, we, we've we've done we've done some work like this, but I I I I wish to start by letting you know that Nigeria is actually in West Africa and not not. Now the reason why <laughs> the reason why I'm telling you this is because I know you've shown your interest to be in Kakuta Republic so that you don't buy <laughs> you don't buy a ticket to Morocco or Egypt instead of West Africa. <laughs> you know? Thank you, thank you. Now, um, secondly, I, I have seen a lot of my friends um, from Kenya who have joined in. And these are the people I talk to all the time. And um, I think there is this joke that goes around in the internet and social media about how Nigerians do their pronunciations. And I know one of them who, have, who has been on my neck for a very long time. So she's here. And I know she's going to make some comments after now. But I want you to understand what that is that word that you pronounce that Kenyans are so exactly I want about. To, I want to give an example like I want I want you to understand that in the course of my of my lecture if I say something is funny please understand that in Kenya what what they mean is that it is actually funny you know so you have to bear with me um you know because we you know because um, the colonial masters stayed for a longer time in Nigeria we speak better English than people in East Africa. So I wish you understand that. So thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I, will, I will go straight to the point because um, I have an attitude towards lectures like this. Um, and the, the reason is um, I tell people that why I, I attend lectures like this is for two reasons. Before COVID came is to network and perhaps learn some specific areas of law. And... This lecture is on specific area of law, which is sports law, then an AI, the ethical aspect of AI and legal consideration. And I am happy to be here and I'll be, I'll be, I'll be willing to do the best I can to enable all the lawyers who come around here to go home with something. Luckily, doctor spoke before me and doctor coming from the academia, he has summarized everything and he has taught us the, the whole definitions that we need to know surrounding them. Um, artificial intelligence. So that spares me from going into definitions in my own presentation. So I will go straight to the point. And the question I know that will be in the mind of a lot of lawyers here, will, uh, I would, uh, there are a lot of questions, but I know the most important one will be, how do we earn a living from this whole artificial intelligence thing? What, how do we earn a living practicing sports law? How do we make more money for our firms in doing this? And I think that will benefit a lot of us if we concentrate on that. Of course, like, like Dr. Rightly pointed out, when artificial intelligence or technology innovations came into sports, a lot of people opposed it, including somebody like me at that time, you know, opposed it. But you see, with time, we'll, we'll, find that, um, we'll find out that it has come to stay, that it has come to stay and there's nothing we can do other than to embrace it. And by the time we embrace it, we begin to see the we begin to see the advantages in um, we begin to see the advantages in, in in sports i want to share my screen i don't know if it's visible 
Philip, can you confirm if it's physical? If it's I can visible? confirm. Fantastic. Now, good. Um, <laughs> um, you know, they, they, oh, there are there are there are about four stakeholders in in sports, right? We have the people who played sports. We have people who consume sports. We have people in the business of sports, and we have people who regulate and administer sports, right? Now, the good news here is this: that in all these in all these categories, lawyers lawyers play a very important part. We deliver service to people who play sports. We deliver service to people who consume sports. We deliver service to people who are in the business of sports. For example, the the, the those who are in charge of um, sports facilities, those who, in, who are in charge of um, manufacturing of sports wares, the likes of Nike, the likes of um, Puma, Speedo, and the rest of them. And we also deliver services to people who regulate, who regulate and administer sports. So as lawyers, we are, we, have, we are stakeholders in all the categories, okay? And for me, that is good news. Now, artificial intelligence and um, artificial intelligence and um, and legal considerations. Doctor has said a lot about how artificial intelligence or technology innovations um, affect sports. But what is happening right now? What is happening right now is that technology innovations seem to be running faster than regulators. Now, the reason is simple to understand. You know, the people who are in the business of sports, the likes of the, the, the big guys, like the likes of Nike, Puma, Speedo, Adidas, and all, all those guys, they, they spend a lot of money to ensure that um, their products give advantage to, to whoever they are in contract with for sponsorship. So they spend a lot of money in research and development. And in, and in spending this research and development, sometimes they go overboard to, to give unfair advantage to those that use their, that those that use their um, products. Now, they seem to be running faster than regulators. So if we look at the events of the past 10 years, what we normally see is a situation where if something will happen after the event, the regulators will now come back to address it. They don't get to address it before that time. It shows how fast these guys are moving in this. And that is that has also developed a new area of doping, which we call technology doping. Now, technology doping, of course, I believe that we all understand what doping means. Doping ordinarily, before technology started to make inroad, the, the, uh, doping, we all understood doping as taking something in some form of drugs to enhance performance and give unfair advantage. Now, there's a word called technology doping. Technology doping simply means that people are now using technology to also gain advantage of gain advantage in sporting competitions, which now affect the integrity of sports. Okay, so the regulators are uh, the regulators are under serious pressure to 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 regulate some of these things. Then the the businesses are also working very hard to be smarter than the system. Then they are now dragging the players along because if they don't drag the players along, they won't they won't, they won't succeed. So they are dragging the players along, making sure that they beat regulators. And most times they succeed in doing that. And you see the, um, the regulators acting in retro spec. Now, that is the situation we have found ourselves. Now, the ethical issues and lawyers, what do I need to know as a lawyer? I think this is a very important aspect of the, of the, of the lecture. For those of us who might want to continue with our sports law practice and um, or want to go into sports law, sports law practice. How do I use technology to my advantage within the ambit of the ethics? Now, good. Technology advancement, advancements or AI is good news for lawyers. Now, I, it's, 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 it's good news for us. So we don't have business opposing it. Now, I will tell you how that is good news for us. But before you take advantage of it, um, I'm sorry, I think my slide cut off at some point. I will make it available. I'll make it available after the, after the lecture. After the lecture. Now, we, we, we are lawyers. We are lawyers. So basically what we do is to advise our clients on, 
how to go about the affairs within the ambit of the law. Now, I want to also believe that the people, um, my colleagues who are attending this conference are mostly lawyers in private practice. And uh, this lecture is not for regulators. So I am not exactly interested about what regulators should be doing. But I am particularly interested in what lawyers and private practice should be doing within the ambit of the policies formulated by regulators. So how do we deal with it? I'm going to use um, two examples or, or events that happened in sports. Um, I will begin with, um, I think, um, the, the, the controversy around um, Eliud's, Eliud's Kipchoge. I know athletics is a very popular sport in East Africa. So I think a lot of us will, will connect and relate with, um, with the controversies around Eliud Kipchoge. Now, Eliud, Eliud, okay, for, to give a background for those who may not know or who may have forgotten, in, in sometime in, in 2019, Elite Kipchoge broke a record with um sorry okay Elite Kipchoge broke a record with um with um the wearing um the, the the Nike shoes of course Nike was sponsoring him at the time okay so he was wearing a, a shoe called the Alpha Fly a Nike running shoe the Alpha Fly. And with that, he was able to beat the world record in the marathon, I think about 42 kilometer marathon in less than two hours. Though that marathon was not awarded to him, that record was not awarded to him, but not because of the fly, the fly, the alpha fly shoe. Now, there are two kinds of shoes. In one of the events, I think it was in 2020 that he took part, Kipchoge used the, used the a shoe a, a running shoe called um, the the uh, the flavor the favor the favor fly yes I think that's the name the favor fly and after that event a lot of competitors began to you know make some cases against him that um, the shoes that shoe that particular brand of shoe by Nike gave him an advantage gave him an advantage and uh, it became a controversy which also led to the World Athletics um, redefining their regulations. And what did they come out with? They came out with, they came out with two things. One, that before you will use any such, any such new product that particularly gives advantage, two factors must be fulfilled. The first factor would be that um, those, that brand of shoe would have been, uh, would have been available um, about four months before that, if, before the tournament. So the purpose of that is to make sure that that shoe is available and readily accessible to a lot of people before that. Now it also helped in they, they regulated the size of the of the shoe sole to a maximum a, a maximum of 40, 40 mm. So, but however, they did not they did not ban the 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 the, the, the fly shoe, and that is where. I begin to now address my colleagues on, the, on this. First of all, for you to begin to have a good practice in sports law today, you must be abreast of technology. Not just abreast of technology, you must be abreast of the outcomes of research and development of some of these companies. Now, let's imagine, because before uh, the, the, the role of lawyers basically was around drafting uh, drafting them. Um, sports contracts, but he has, with, with, with the advent of technology, innovations, artificial intelligence, he has gone beyond that. Now, you need to, we need to understand, going to the days and say, ah, oh, we're lawyers, we're we not technology experts. To be a good sports lawyer, you also have to have more than a basic knowledge of technology and how it works. Now, for example, if you are, if you are, if, if, if a runner or an athlete in, in Kenya decides to, work, decides to brief you and say, look, I am competing in the, in the Olympics this year and um, Adidas has offered me this shoe and this, these are the, this is how the shoe, this is what they want me to wear. What is your advice? Now for you to be able to, to deliver that service, 
you must have an idea of what technology was used for that shoe, what purpose, how it was built. You must be able to know that. And that is why the first advice I will give at this point, and um, perhaps I've mentioned before, is for us to be abreast of, the, of, of technology, how things are done, how things are produced. Now, that will help you in giving, um, in giving that advice. And in giving that, uh, uh, that advice, you, you, you would have been able to go to the regulator's website or to, to look at the regulations governing it to make sure that your claim does not um, go against the law. But you know, as lawyers too, we are, we are if, even if you want your, your client to bend the law without actually breaking it, you must have a knowledge of the law first before now advising them on how to bend it without actually breaking it. Because sports today has gone beyond entertainment. Sports is politics today. Sports is business. Sports is a lot of things. Sports is even religion to a lot of people. So there's nothing we can do as lawyers in delivering services in this, in this, in this aspect of, of, of our practice than to embrace that fact that the, 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 the hustle, like they say, is real when it comes to sports. So we need to be abreast of it because any mistake, any mistake we make in, in, in advising our clients, you will see that um, our clients will keep going behind, lagging behind in, in, sports, in, in sports events. Okay. Now, let me also, um, let me also refer to the issue of um, the, the, the controversy around the swimsuit. In, in, for those of us that follow the, the, Beijing, the Beijing Olympics of, of 2010, yes. It was at that time that Speedo, Speedo, it's a, a sports wear manufacturers, but they, 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 their interest is in swimming. They came out with a swimsuit they called Shark, Shark swimsuit. Okay. Now, this Shark swimsuit, according to Speedo, they said that they, they, they went through um, a simulation of Shark of how the shark moves in water. So they got a simulation, they built it into that swimsuit. And do you know what happened? 38 of all the sweet people or all the swimmers at that competition broke world record. 38 of them were wearing the L LZR, LZR swimsuit from Speedo. Now that started a controversy. What happened? Could it, have, could it be that the technology in building that swimsuit gave an unfair advantage to those who use that, swim, that swimsuit. Well, what happened? The truth of the matter is that nothing happened. But how did that event affect, how did it disrupt, bring some form of disruption to the practice of sports law? Let me tell you something. After that event, now the, 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 the athletes or swimmers who used the shark swimsuit built by Speedo, came from two countries, from United States of America and from Australia. And they got about 38, they broke about 38 records wearing that. Now, co subsequently, countries like Italy, countries like Belgium or Netherlands and some other countries who had contracts with other, other manufacturers started having issues with it, started reneging on their contracts, started pushing the, for the review of the contracts and all that. So now, what does that teach us? What, what that will teach us today in the practice of sports law is this, that as, 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 as a lawyer advising on, on, sports, on sports events, sports contracts, you must take into consideration consequences of artificial intelligence, and technology innovations in drafting your contract. Now, that has given us an insight that in such contracts, you must include something like, in event, in event that there is a superior product coming out. I'm just giving an example. It's not something we can, we should copy verbatim, but it's something is just meant to give us an idea of what we should be doing in, in our sports contracts. In event that another, another company, brings comes up with a superior product that gives an advantage that is acceptable by the by the governing body the 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 sponsor i mean the manufacturer here will be able to provide same equivalent of such product to us or 
it shall be a ground for for us to for to to renege or or leave the contract. I don't know if I'm making any sense. So that has also changed the way we draft our contracts as sports. But you will not be able to know what and um, what what clauses or what terms to put if you're not abreast of this development. Let me give you a hypothetical case. Let's assume the let's assume the uh, the, uh, the the a, a, a company ABC ABC decides to go into a contract with the Athletics Athletics Association in, in, in Uganda and they are trying to sponsor XYZ for the Olympics and they walk into your office and say, look, we need a lawyer to advise on this. How are you? What are the things you are going to take into, into consideration? The things you are going to take into consideration today are quite different from the things you would have taken into consideration 10 years ago. You must take into consideration technology innovations. You must take into consideration the ethics. You see, now I will talk about I will talk about the ethics and you know the, the ethical aspect of it. But you see, in today there's just a gray line between when you are within the ambit of ethics and when you are out of it. You can be outside the ethics today, and tomorrow it is justified, just just like what happened in the case of Kipchoge. Now, if if the if the manufacturer is saying we are going to give you a new running shoes for the guy in Kampala, we are going to give you a, a new running shoes. You should ensure that such contracts, that such contracts also have clauses that shows that the the manufacturers will make it available for at least four months before that tournament. It must be in that contract because if don't if they don't make that shoe available four months before the contract. The guy you are representing will be falling foul of ethical practice and may be disqualified. So while you are drafting the contract, you should also have that in mind. You should also get from the sponsor or manufacturer who is sponsoring your client that, look, these new shoes that you're going to introduce through our client must also be accessible to other people. Not just making it available. It must also be accessible. It must also meet the regulation. So these are the things that you will ensure that these are the aspects of the contract that you must be very particular about because of what technology has taught us today. So it has also changed the way we, it has also changed the way we, we, we practice, we, we practice sports. Okay. Now, um, um, I am advising on, um, on regulation. Like I've mentioned two or three times before, the most important thing we should be doing as lawyers is to make sure we read, we keep reading, we keep updating our knowledge because we need to be following what is going on with the regulators. Anytime they want, before events, before tournaments, very important tournaments, what are the, what would be the prevailing, the prevailing, the prevailing um, policy? Because if we don't follow them up, we see ourselves, you know, how do we train? Because in, 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 in advisory roles in, in sports law, because I don't think a lot of countries, especially those of us in Africa, appreciate the role of a sports lawyer. The role starts from day one, even while you are training. What are you supposed to use for your training? What, what, is the, what are the dimensions? What are the specifications of technologies you are able to use while you're training? What are the, technology, what are the dimensions or specification of technologies you are able to use while, while you are playing? You should be able to know that you should be able to also, because if, if you want to take advantage of the law or the regulations, you should also, like I said, you should also know those regulations. So basically that is, um, that is what um, I think those of us who are lawyers should pay attention to for us to begin to earn a living. But are there aspects of, there, are there aspects of um, um, technology innovation that's, that scare me so much? Yes. But it has nothing to do with our relationship with players. It also has it has nothing to do with our relationship with those who run the business of sports or perhaps the regulators. The, the, the only one that, that scared me, and I think um, we as we as lawyers may not have much say on it, is how how we consume sports. And that is this new new development on predictive pre predictive sports. Now there's this technology that's, that has been pushing. To, that will make that will make sports very predict, very predictable, you know. 
Nigeria, like the, like the Nigerian South African match, the, you know, the, the, there's this technology that, that is being tested and being used in some places to predict the outcome. And if this technology comes up, that's not going to be good news because I think the excitement, the, the, the intrigues, the, the waiting, the suspense is part of sports and that is, is, is going to kill, is going to kill the, the, the sports industry. Because if we're able to predict it, I may not need to watch and money will not be made in sports. But I'm not in any way suggesting that the match yesterday between Nigeria and South Africa, we, we didn't need any technology to, to predict who was going to win. It was obvious that Nigeria was going to win. So what I'm saying does not apply to, to that aspect. Well, this is this on the lighter note. I will stop there, but I, I guess by the time questions begin to come in, I'll be able to address some very gray areas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Atata. Thank you for that presentation. And uh, my key takeaway is that we need to be abreast with the, with the trends that move with the sports subsector, more so as practitioners, because this is where we need to find the business that we need to get into or make money from. There was actually yes. a comment from Nigeria still, which said, yeah, the money question. Uh, maybe I can only add on something uh, around the COVID period, World Anti-Doping Association was I had uh, amassed some, some funds into research, more so to come up with systems that could be able to detect things like steroids, things that enhance performance within the players. So there could be certain ethical issues around that that would also call for legal attention and business. Otherwise, I thank you for that presentation. And I know that uh, as we get along, of course, there are challenges that call for the direct intervention of uh, sportsmen, the challenges that call for direct intervention of the legal minds, and the other players, like the whole sports ecosystem is, which is going to create business for people who have taken passion into sports law practice. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Mr. Atata. I'll call upon our next speaker. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I'll call upon our next speaker who I'll ask to be very brief. I know he has a very good presentation. Uh, he has a good presentation. Uh, Mr. Timothy, if you're on call, please confirm. Yes, yes, I'm on, I'm on call. Yes, please, uh, you'll take some short time to make a presentation. After your challenges, we will need to hear from uh, how the challenges can be resolved, disputes that will arise. I, I hinted earlier that the EU is coming up with the AI Act. So please take the floor. Yes, uh, can, can my screen be seen? Yes, we can see it. I can see it from my side. All right, all right, all right, all right. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction and uh, thanks for my fellow panelists who have already shared uh, insightfully on uh, this topic for the day. Uh, what I'm going to add is really uh, the opportunities that AI presents to us as sports lawyers. And uh, this is where we fit in. This is uh, why we, uh, this is our, our ask in when we come to this, what do we benefit? How can we be of help as um, lawyers in this space? The first one that you need to know of is really data protection. Now, AI, these uh, models that uh, not only receive from us and process, but they self-generate. But where do they get what they generate is from the data that they are in which uh, that is fed into these AI systems. And this data largely is personal data. If we are to get the median range of the strength of Messi's shot, or, uh, or how fast uh, Chipchoge uh, can run, or how strong uh, someone's uh, LeBron's basketball shot, when do we expect them to get that? 
we first mine the data uh, from these people that uh, have been there on pitch, on pitch for long. We check the average, uh, depending on how many years Messi has played, what is the trend, all this is data. So for them to operate, to give us an output, to, to give us an accurate prediction, to guide us on what foods we should eat, when we should eat, the level of sugar, uh, how, how, how much we should sleep, it's, it's, it starts with all the data that we feed into these uh, systems. And um, because this is personal data, all of at least across uh, East Africa, we know in, uh, in Tanzania, we know in Kenya, we know Uganda, there are, there are data protection offices. And so for starters, for any of these players to be compliant with the laws in and around East Africa and beyond, firstly, they must be compliant with the data protection standards. How do we help them get there? Firstly, is helping them register with those uh, relevant offices, and in the process of registering, there is a pertinent uh, box that they should tick. This is having a data protection officer. And this is also an opportunity for you. So in addition, as you helping them register, also tell them that, by the way, I can offer you the services of a data protection officer. And then that way, you can be able to uh, have something to do from, from there. Also, still data protection, you can help them deal or respond to any data protection queries. This may include someone raising a complaint directly with them or online, you know, social media is a thing now, so you can't run away from it. So uh, if someone comes up and says company XY or club XY has violated my data, probably I attended uh, an event over the weekend with my family and then a picture of my child was taken without my, of course, my knowledge or something. And then I see it on the next uh, public SEC club poster. So how do you respond to these data protection breaches? So you help them uh, design a system, how they can receive complaints and also respond uh, to these uh, complaints. And then the other is offering them trainings because they have uh, lots of teams, huge teams. Uh, you look at the companies such as Opta Data that support the Premier League, those that support uh, the, the Saudis. These are big companies that have many people. Many of them are IT people, but these do not know much about data protection. So an opportunity for you is to take these uh, these uh, these companies or these clubs or these associations through, through protections on uh, on data protection. That is one. The other second uh, avenue for us to make some money is on IT certification. Now here, as uh, AI is meted out by companies that offer software as a service, that means for them to offer this service or this product they must first confirm to the required uh, standards of the duration in which they operate. You don't just come. For example, in Uganda, if you're saying that you offer IT services, you, that service must be, uh, must be certified, audited and certified by NITA you here. Same thing we have also the ICT authority of Kenya. So these bodies come out and first audit the product that you have or service and confirm that really it's, it's, uh, it's one that co uh, complies with the international standards. Also internationally, uh, for credibility of these players in this space, they also have uh, bodies such as ESO that give you worldwide uh, certification. And, thus, and that way, they give your brand mileage and they prove to the public that indeed the IT products uh, provided by this company, by this club, by this association is indeed uh, fit for purpose. The other opportunity that is there is really intellectual property. Now, because uh, what is behind this AI and everything, this IT is really the algorithm So and the code. So we cannot really see, uh, see this code. We cannot see the code. So what do we see? We see the first value, the value that these uh, systems provide to us. And how do, we, uh, how do we categorize that? Or how do we protect say that? Probably this product is given by this certain company, it's by Adidas. Or well, you don't see the code behind probably your training gear, if it's a vest that can take um, uh, the, the response of your body, uh, how your body is responding to training or medication, uh, or whether you're in the pool, how fast you're doing that. Um, it is, you don't see the, the technology behind that. You only see the service provider. And how do you protect these guys? It's by uh, uh, dealing with their registering and protecting that um, intellectual property. So here you need to be uh, very, very cautious to know which intellectual property applies to which uh, given um, uh, given body. Uh, for, for example, let us say uh, in Uganda, for example, IT 
falls under the copyright regime, the Copyright and Neighboring Rights Act. But that's not the case for Kenya. That's not the case for, uh, the case for South Africa. There, they're looked at as, as patents. And patent is uh, any product that can, give us, uh, that can give us industrial applicability. So you must study clearly and appreciate which, uh, which branch of intellectual property does this fit. Are they image rights uh, uh, the case in Uganda? Are they trademarks? Uh, of course, trademarks is, is quite easy as long as you, you make the mark that it does mark. We also then all know the Nike mark. If you know these marks, also then our clubs do have uh, their club badges so we can identify the quality of their IT service or product depending on, um, on, really, on really their logos or their trademarks. And then we can uh, go on safeguarding them uh, depending on where you are. So this varies. I, um, Intellectual property is jurisdictional, so you must be uh, very cautious and study and confirm which bracket of intellectual property does this product for, uh, fall under, so that you can be able to give uh, your, your clients a good service that they can pay you well. The other that uh, we look out for is cybersecurity advisory. All this is a network. It's a network, it's, and this is cyber, this is IT. But uh, the way we protect IT is not the same way as you, you probably parade police officers around around your home or, or your car or something. No, it's not how it works. You, we must create, or the, uh, the proprietors of these products must create um, IT security infrastructure. And now you as a lawyer, not being an IT person, how do you help them? That is one. Um, firstly, it is policy design. Behind Behind this, one, like, I, like I said, these uh, they, are, they have IT people that really work out the code and the algorithm to work out. These people, you must design policies for them to safeguard their products uh, in internally in the company and externally. Uh, so the, the interface is different when you're inside and outside. But what guides us? For example, people now work remotely. Can, uh, for example, if we have journalists that are reporting live uh, uh, for my very cost at the AFCON. If they go out with uh, the company laptop, probably let, let's say let's say probably if this is a media person or an IT person that is uh, supporting Nigeria and they're out in uh, in Abidjan, they have to work on a final. So do they just leave their laptops there and go and take a, a grab or a, grab a cup of coffee? Uh, what are the chances that someone may attack them at that point? If they have passwords, should they just automatically locked uh, lock these passwords? Uh, in, in the app that everyone who has access to the PC has access to the password, therefore has access to the digital infrastructure of the company, the club, or, or, or the association. So those are the policies that you design for, for them. You tell them the do's and nots, depending on how IT progress that like we've had, IT changes much faster than the law. So you can't wait for the law. You have to design internal policies that safeguard the digital infrastructure of that company. Then We are losing you, Timothy. Uh, was subjected to an IT attack recently. Hello. Yes, we can get you now. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I had fallen off. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. I was uh, I was really concluding a uh, uh, policy design and review. In that, uh, you, uh, because the law moves at a much slower pace than um, than technology, you don't wait for the law. You design internal protocols that guide the digital infrastructure of a company, of a club, or an association. The other one is responding to cyber attacks. What I'm saying is that uh, even if you, you tick all the boxes, because even the hackers are also uh, as good or even or even better. It's very good that you also design a response to an attack. I was giving FIFA as the example. Recently, FIFA was also uh, subject to a cyber attack, and then clubs were being sent fictitious email from uh, emails from the genuine FIFA emails. So some clubs would respond to FIFA, communicating to them, and then that's how people would attack those clubs and uh, get whatever they uh, they could get from them. So uh, it's at times it's unavoidable that you are subject to um, an attack. Uh, but once you, if you're subject to an attack, you must design the responses. How do you communicate to what what channels do you do you do you strike down? Um, and uh, how do you respond quickly? Whom do you report to? 
and then uh, how do we communicate to the public that we have suffered an attack in a manner that will not uh, raise any challenges. The other one that is also common for them that you can help them is ransomware. Now ransomware is where uh, a, a company or a club is attacked, but the attacker is not taking anything. They're just asking them for money. So uh, it's like just it's just like uh, often when we, we all know kidnapping. So now this guy is not kidnap someone, but they actually kidnap your IT infrastructure. So you must help them be able to respond to such ransomware attacks. Do they uh, contact the authorities? When do they do that? And which authority, depending on the country where you are, do you contact if you've suffered a ransomware attack? The other way to safeguard uh, how these uh, companies can really uh, safeguard their operations is cyber uh, insurance. Now we have insurance plans that you must at times coin and then propose to these insurance companies to be able to uh, provide any relief in case a, a company or a, a club has suffered a cyber attack and uh, this is how they, they mainly come in to compensate the damage that has been caused by the attack after the attack. Yes, um, the, other, the other facet that we can come in as lawyers is uh, AI code management. Like I said, uh, now these are virtual properties. It's not like when you have your car parked outside or your piece of land somewhere. These are virtual properties. Now, how we manage them is that often we use um, we use uh, different uh, arrangements to make sure that this code is safe. Otherwise, you may buy some code that does something. Probably you you, you have you you you're the one providing via uh, software at Afcon, and then all of a sudden um, they created because uh, because CAF does not create the AI behind the VR at at, at, at Afcon. Someone else creates it. What if that someone withholds it, probably exercises their right of a lien over that code? What do you do? Does AFCON stop there? We are waiting for the referee to confirm to us if there's a penalty awarded or not. Do we wait? Now, this we manage, that's how you need to manage the AI code, uh, the, the codes be, behind the AI that supports uh, uh, sport. How we start already, Anthony has a mentioned piece of it, it's the, the software contract that we draft in uh, this AI uh, for sports uh, for, for sports bodies. They are very, very different. And the key clause is that these guys, although they, they may have uh, access to maintain, to maintain, uh, to maintain, um, to maintain the, because code is always updated. That's why you update our apps, update our phones every time. Code is also always updated. Now, you might want to give them access to that. But that does not mean that they remain the owners of that code. That code has to be uh, retained by the body that buys or the club that buys that AI. So you must be uh, keen on that where we're drafting those contracts. Then the other one is really onboarding. You cannot onboard everyone. We've spoken about IT certification. Now, before you onboard anyone to su supply these IT services or products, you must make sure that they are certified where they are internationally. If that uh, the use of that AI is going to have an international perspective, you must get international certification and local certification. So you want to be also clear on that. Then the escrow code management is here. If, for example, it may be a club that you want to sell that's buying the software but cannot keep uh, the software forever. So what happens in those, in such circumstances is that you must get a third party to help the club hold the software soft, uh, uh, well or safely for it to safeguard it from um, the people who create it, reclaiming it, or the people who create it, designing bugs or designing ransomware attacks. So you get a third party to manage it, but that doesn't mean that, don't mean that uh, that software belongs to the, the third party. So it's also what we can equate to a trust when you're holding public land in a trust for someone. Same thing, they, they hold the code uh, in, in trust for the company or the club or the federation. The other one is AI uh, doping. We've had uh, uh, Anthony also sharing earlier that um, that many of these technologies are such, and for, for them to see that did they give an unnatural or an unfair advantage to a certain athlete in a given uh, event. So you want to be sure that the AI that uh, the code that you're bringing on does not fall within the ambit of AI doping in that. that it is one that gives unfair advantage because what that means, if uh, an athlete, probably a boxer, a streamer, a runner, uh, has won uh, has won a medal at the Olympics, 
but because you permitted them to use an AI that is really uh, give, gives them that unnatural or unfair advantage over the others, then they lose out the medal. Yeah, probably they could have won the medal with or without that AI. So you want to be sure that the AI that you're bringing on board to help the athlete does not, in brackets, help that athlete dop using the AI. Yes, uh, that is it from, from me, Philip. I, I, I guess I'll take the questions at the end of uh, the session. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. That's been a good one. I think members will agree with me that the topic we are discussing today cuts across different areas of practice, but it is hinged in the passion that we have, which is sports law. Next on call is uh, Peter Moshekilwa. Managing Partner at uh, Blue Strategic Consult Services, Tanzania. He is a practitioner of sports law with, with particular interest in uh, e-sport. He has been moving around East Africa. The last two weeks I was with him in Kampala here, trying to find out. E-sport is one of the areas that uh, that is an emerging trend in sport. But along with it comes aspects of artificial intelligence and uh, intellectual property. And what in South Africa they have actually, they have categorized e-sport as a mind game. We are aware that spending too much time on uh, technology devices could affect your mind. So we need to have a small discussion and insight into the effect of AI on eSport as an emerging trend. Mr. Peter Mushkilwa, if you're on call, yeah, kindly you. confirm that you're on call before we get into one of the most interesting areas, which is uh, disputes that may arise I'll beg you to use the shortest time possible to give us an insight, a brief insight, because we shall have a detailed discussion later on eSport and AI, a detailed, ins a small insight into the emerging opportunities and the effect of AI. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Philip, for having me. And uh, it has been a pleasure meeting with uh, other panelists from West Africa. And uh, I would be very much in grief because looking at the time is not our best ally. And uh, I will also narrow down my presentation by just to give a hint on uh, imagine trends uh, that uh, artificial intelligence is taking into sports law. As we all understand, uh, artificial intelligence is not a new phenomenon. It has been there for some ages. But the main thing which I would want to, to pose as a discussion on this uh, 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 program is on how uh, artificial intelligence has been a transmotive uh, uh, potential to sports law. Uh, now, given the fact that uh, of recent, we have a, 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 a EU, I mean, the European Union is now on uh, drafting artificial intelligence uh, regulation to cater for need of uh, sports law. And uh, there have been a lot of pressing problem concerning artificial intelligence, and some have been uh, talked by uh, Antonia Tata and uh, Dr. Emmanuel. But just to hint, uh, uh, the, the, the issue of uh, uh, I mean, artificial intelligence uh, varies depending on jurisdiction. Uh, for instance, in uh, 
in, a, in China and the United States where they have taken a freedom path to avoid a lot of regulations uh, into uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, with the with the Euro European Union is, is a different uh, route, where they have uh, taken a, a, a response uh, on each aspect uh, of artificial intelligence in sports law, uh, and this can be uh, appreciated by looking on uh, the the general data protection regulation. And uh, of recent, the 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 coming of uh, uh, artificial intelligence regulation, where they have now uh, tackled on the aspect of uh, uh, the aspect of legality and uh, the aspect of liability, uh, where in uh, in in the aspect of liability, uh, the main concern is uh, on Making sure that all, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the, 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 the deployer of uh, uh, programs or software concerning artificial intelligence must be liable in case there are mistakes. Uh, uh, for instance, we of recent we have a, a, a goal. Uh, 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 I mean, a goal uh, line technology which was introduced by FIFA. Now, the issue is whenever there are some mistakes or some discrepancies, uh, it should be bared bear on the uh, developer or the deployer of the software. Uh, that is on the liability uh, side. On the legality now is on the issue of risk, where they have. Uh, Itemized, I mean, they have itemized uh, some list, uh, ranging from high list to low list and the uh, medium list. Where now the, the, the deployer or the, the, the developer of the software must have to, 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 to undergo on how to mitigate the risk. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it has also taken some consideration on uh, on uh, human rights uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of as what as uh, Timos has highlighted on the issue of intellectual property the issue the issue of data protection as we understand uh, uh, we do not we, we do have natural and artificial uh, protection on the intellectual rights but we don't have intellectual light on machines. So that has uh, to be dealt with, with, the, with, the, with the coming of the, the EU, uh, uh, of uh, EU artificial intelligence regulation. But at last, uh, because of, of time, uh, uh, there have been some issues which uh, uh, need not to be left alone, as what Dr. Emmanuel has said. Uh, as you understand the artificial intelligence, we have witnessed some, some, some issues and some controversies uh, uh, phenomena, uh, you see, with the coming of artificial intelligence, for instance, the issue of, uh, of uh, WADA, uh, whereby the, the, the software was attacked. Uh, we have also uh, witnessed some illegal broadcasting uh, from different uh, uh, people with personal data. So these are the issues which are, need not to be taken into isolation when, uh, when we, we, we deal with artificial intelligence. And uh, on conclusion, uh, uh, it, it, it is, it is a, 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 a call now, a high call, to stakeholders, uh, 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 whether in Africa or in, uh, in the globe, now to consider uh, some fundamental issues 
which will be affected with the, with the, with the, with the, with the use and the method of artificial intelligence. Uh, so for now, because of time, uh, I could not uh, have time to share with my presentation. It's almost uh, 60 pages. So I will share uh, in real time with, with, the, with the organizers, at least the participant can have a look and uh, see on uh, what I have gathered from uh, my presentation. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Mr. Peter. Thank you, Peter, for that brief presentation. I had to cut you short because uh, we are going into an area where most lawyers think that the money is kept, which is uh, dispute resolution. Uh, with me today, I'm uh, co-hosting with uh, with uh, Judith Zebidayo from Vinare Law Chambers, Tanzania. I need to confirm if she's on call. I know that she's on the, she was appointed to the FIFA Chambers. I need to confirm that she's on call so she can take on the session as we welcome Aisha Abdallah, head dispute resolution at, uh, at uh, Africa Legal Network, Anjawala and Kana, Nairobi. She hosted us last year for the navigation, navigating your career as a sports law practitioner. A very good session that is shared on uh, the ELS social media channels. If as Judith comes in, I think if Aisha is ready, she can uh, confirm to us and take on the presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, you asked me to speak about um, disputes uh, arising from the impact of AI in sports. Um, and some of these issues have already been touched on by the previous speakers, but I'll just go through them in terms of um, disputes. Firstly, disputes that relate to athletes. Um, there are a number of challenges with um, athletes using wearable devices that collect uh, data, which is then used to monitor their performance, and maybe um, their, their recovery from injuries and other issues like that. Um, there's an issue about the quality of the data that these devices collect and provide because there's no universal standard for, um, for minimum data quality. And obviously if decisions are being made impacting athletes um, based on poor data, then this could, uh, number one, be very harmful to their careers and they may be able to bring cases for them being exited from clubs or dropped from sponsorship as a result of um, inaccurate data. Also, um, there's a question about how is this, who owns this data? That The data is very personal and sensitive. It often relates to athletes' health um, and it is a category of data that is protected under the laws. Um, and in Kenya, it would be subject to a constitutional right of privacy. Uh, it is not clear who owns the data that is collected and also how this data can be used. Now, assuming the data is accurate and of high quality, there's still a question mark about how it can be used. So for example, I know in one of the US uh, sports, um, they have agreed that uh, wearable device data cannot be used against athletes in termination of contracts. So that is a specific area where a sports person would be disadvantaged because the, the team would have this data that was maybe they were told was collected to improve their performance and assist them. But then later, maybe this data is now 
being uh, used for another purpose, which they had not agreed to at the outset, which is to be used to terminate their contract. So that's just a, an example of a dispute that comes out of how data is used, assuming the data is even accurate. Um, some of the concerns about the way data is collected is that we don't know whether the makers of these devices have sufficiently customized them so that data is specific to context, region, and culture. Um, so that if a device is created in China, it is still suitable and fit for purpose for athletes who are using it in Africa. And that, again, comes back to the accuracy of the data. Um, then we have the issue of decisions being made to pick athletes or drop them because of the performance data. And one of the challenges is that we know as human beings that different athletes respond differently depending on their environment, depending on their personal interaction with their coaches. And you can see that the same athlete who appears not to be performing well under one coach or manager who then moves or changes um, is then able to perform very well, which makes you wonder to what extent this data is even useful um, because it's, you cannot capture the personal interaction. So you will see sometimes it's, it's very obvious that there's an issue between that athlete and their coach and that that is affecting their motivation and performance. But this is not something that is captured by these, uh, by the devices or by AI, because AI by its nature is not human. And so there are certain things it will not be able to capture. And so again, the question arises, how fair and accurate is this data? And, and is it actually useful in assessing um, how athletes perform? So that's one bucket of disputes. Another bucket of disputes, and here I have to disagree with our first uh, very distinguished speaker, Dr. Emmanuel. Um, I am one of the people who was um, initially in favor of the introduction of VAR and goal line technology in football, and I'm now firmly against it because the way it was sold to us as spectators was that this type of technology would actually eliminate it would eliminate uncertainty and poor decisions by referees. And what we have seen in the Premier League is the exact opposite. We are spending far too much time interrogating decisions that have been made by VAR. Number one, whether or not VAR should have intervened at all. Number two, when it intervened, whether the actual decision was correct. So the um, Premier League has released some data and they are saying pre-introduction of VAR and goal line technology, referee decision-making, which was generally of a high standard at 82%, has now increased to 94%. But there have been confirmed errors with the use of VAR. And that is because if you look at the VAR system, it still has human elements. Um, so I'm an Arsenal fan. And I remember being terribly aggrieved when the Brentford goal, which was an offside against Arsenal, was upheld by VAR because of a simple failure by the humans in the room to draw the correct lines so that VAR could decide whether or not a particular goal was offside. So you have the interplay between humans and uh, technology, and then you simply have a failure of technology. And there have been new instances noted and there are articles discussed where you have maybe the errors are few but because the overall rationale was that it would eliminate uncertainty I would say overall there has been a failure in this and what it has done is in fact increase disputes so for example when VAR has um, led to red cards being issued against players um, those those uh, teams have then challenged the decision. We know that that is happening at, as we speak. So they are leading to more disputes. What is also happening is we're having a stop in the natural flow of play, which is very um, annoying if you're in the stadium, but also if you're watching it live at home. Um, so in fact, I would disagree with the doctor and I would say 
viewer experience and engagement has decreased because of the technology, because we're spending far too much time. And, and you can see this because we're having stoppage time of 10 minutes, which was unheard of. A 90 minute match is now going to 100 minutes normal time because 10 whole minutes are being taken up, wasting time because VAR officials cannot make a decision. Um, so these are some of the areas where I don't think, in fact, I think then they lead to more disputes. Um, in terms of just a summary of the overall legal issues, um, there's a complete lack of legal framework and regulations. There was a mention made about the uh, EU that they are, there's a draft regulation that we're all is likely to become the, the standard in, in the world for regulating AI. It will be a risk-based approach and it will be similar to the European GDPR, which set the standard for data protection. In Kenya, there is currently a draft bill going through parliament. It was uh, brought by a private individual called Fred Sagwe, and it's called the Robotics and AI Society uh, Bill of 2023. But it is actually quite controversial because a number of key stakeholders say that they were never consulted in the drafting of the bill, and they are now giving their comments to parliament. So the individual who has brought the bill is part of the Kenya Robotics Society, and it appears to be primarily focused on robotics, although it attempts to also cover AI, so the AI angle does not seem to be captured. Plus, the bill is being brought ahead of any coherent government policy. So normally what you have is you would have a government who does some research and comes up with a policy uh, framework. Sorry, I think Mr. Tata, you're, you are not on mute. Yeah, I can hear you. You're, if you could mute, because there's some music playing. Um, so... So the point is that this, this draft bill is being brought ahead of time prematurely in advance of any policy framework, whether the policy framework will take a relaxed approach or an over-regulation over approach, we don't know because there isn't a policy. Then the other aspect which was brought out, I think, by a previous speaker, I think it might have been Timothy, um, is that we don't actually have recognized data sets in Kenya and all of this comes back to what is your data and how good is it? How well was it collected and how accurate is it? Um, so in the absence of having our own data, we would struggle to uh, properly monitor uh, this, this specific area. And there are countries that are spending a lot of money um, creating uh, their own data sets, but also they are seeking to buy data uh, or acquire data. So I think there is a race because now the new um, commodity is data. And uh, perhaps before we seek to regulate, we need to also be in that race to create our own data sets. So some of the legal issues that arise are the ethical issues. I've mentioned some of them in relation to managing athletes. Um, privacy concerns, uh, because they are very invasive. Um, uh, security of the data, we've had about incidents of hacking, and a lot of this data is extremely sensitive. And then how is it used? Is the usage ethical? Um, and was there informed consent given at the outset? Um, then we've heard a lot about data protection, so I don't need to go about that. But generally, we come back to this idea about in relation to African sports players and teams and coaches, this whole development of AI in sports, is it going to increase um, fairness or is it going to still mean that those with a lot of money and resources remain dominant? And I mean, I say this because, for example, most sports now are very much commercial enterprises and bring in a lot of money. And that money also is fueled by data. And so those teams that are able to collect and interpret and have teams of uh, researchers and advisors, they will obviously be ahead. And you could see that there, that AI has the potential to perpetuate imbalances that already exist. So there's an imbalance in the resources available in Africa for African sports. 
and the resources available in, in the US and Europe, which are extremely well funded. And the, the thing about AI, generative AI, is that the advantages it gives you are exponential. So the, the gap between those who use the technology and can afford it and those who don't, that gap will not widen in terms of doubling. It will widen in a compound curve, so the gap will be exponential. So on that, on that note, I would say we can look forward to a lot of disputes. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you for that detailed discussion. I think on the last point is where I want to call Dr. Emmanuel, because it relates to what he has written about player manipulation as one of the as one of the problems or challenges that we are going to face with AI into, into sports. You have disagreed with him on certain points. So I wish to call him before we get into the next session to give a quick reaction. I hope he's on call. Dr. Emmanuel. Uh, hello? Yes, doctor. Can you hear me? We can hear you, doctor. Can you give me three minutes? I'm trying to reboot my something. <laughs> doctor, it's okay. Just give me three minutes now. It's okay, doctor. Doctor, what is this something you are trying to put together? <laughs> I don't understand. I'm doing it. In the meantime, I wish to recognize the presence of so many attendees from the different parts of uh, Africa who have been on this call. Benson Chuma. There are a few questions in the Q&A. Brenda Ongalo from Kenya is a sports lawyer and commentator. I've not seen Hello, her Mr. in Yes, doctor. Yes, I'm with you. You said I should react to... Dr. Senior Abdallah disagreed with you on certain points, but also mentioned that what among the critical things is player manipulation. What would be your take or reaction to incidents of player manipulation using AI. Yes, doctor. Okay, I, I, I really don't know, but in the course of my presentation, one of the things I highlighted is the influence of AI. And there is no doubt about the fact that AI uh, have advantages as well as disadvantages. Uh, there is one thing I'd like to say uh, that AI in the sport industry uh, is of two categories. The acceptable uh, within the acceptable limit of uh, use of AI and the unacceptable uh, uh, limit uh, use of AI uh, outside the acceptable use of AI, uh, issues relating to human rights issues, uh, data and privacy violation. Uh, number three, issues of fairness. Uh, number four, issues of sport governance uh, with particular reference to uh, accountability and transparency. And then number five is the issue the challenge of policy uh, formulation. Uh, these have been some of the issues uh, that confront the use of AI in the sport industry. Uh, I really, I really also don't. I didn't say that there are no challenges in the use of AI. There are so many challenges in the use of AI. Uh, but but the paper you asked me to present is on what are the and what are the uh, what, uh, what are the areas of ai in the sport industry and so that was where 
I limited myself, I focused upon, and I highlighted those 12 areas of uh, AI in the sport industry. Seriously, if I'm to go for that, uh, those 12 areas I highlighted are just a few examples of uh, AI in the sport industry. But if I'm to go for that to begin to talk about the ethical and legal implications of AI in the sport industry, um, they will begin to raise the issue of enhanced performance, which Mr. Atata also spoke about, uh, the issue of undue advantages, the issue of privacy, because presently now it is possible to use AI to, to determine the reaction of a referee to a game. So you, you can put in, uh, you can put in to determine if Dr. Emmanuel is going to be the referee for a particular game, uh, you can, there are, AI can help you to gather information about the likelihood uh, reactions, about, about what I would likely do, how I would likely re react to issues. And then the issue of human rights violations, uh, data protections, and lack of privacy because data are now assessed, uh, which is contrary to right to privacy. Then the issue of fairness, like I said. So these are issues uh, generally emanating from uh, AI. I really did not talk so much about the, the controversies, the legality, the extents, and what have you in my paper presentation. I just limited myself to what you assigned to me, which is a highlight of AI in the sport industry. So, but if there are questions, uh, there are questions you want me to attend to beyond what you assigned to me, I'm here, I, I'm willing and ready to do the same. So I do not fault the person who talk about uh, whether there are no uh, due advantage. There are certainly, AI have actually take, taken away the, the fair grant, uh, the fair play, and so many other things have been taken away by AI interventions in the sports industry. Be that as it may, they only call for ethical and legal consideration. But certainly, we can't throw away the baby with the bathwater because AI offers so many advantages to the sports industry. Thank you, thank you, thank you, doctor. Uh, as we come closer to the Q&A session, there are a few questions. That session will be moderated by Judith Zebedayo. She, she sits on the FIFA chambers. Uh, members, you feel free to share your LinkedIn and Twitter handles for networking purposes. Doc Atata here taught me that. He holds uh, one of the biggest networking networking platforms, quote from 100. So I'll call Judith to take over from me in the next few minutes. Judith, kindly unmute. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Philip, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Judith Zebedayo, a sports lawyer based in Jerusalem and a founding partner of Binare Legal Chamber and currently been appointed as the member of the FIFA Football Agent um, Chamber. And I would like to, uh, first of all, say thank you to our extinguished uh, panelists for your presentation. And for the, for the Q&A session, I believe we have a number of questions. I will just go to, um, Two questions two question by Mohammed Aminu. So his question is uh, I think this will go to Mr. Anton Atata. Uh, so, since business, businesses like Puma and Nike are running faster than the regulations, and that they are driven players along in it, technology topic. <laughs> so 
does lawyer have to rely then on the ethics to advise clients on potential issues when regulation have not been considered the state considered the state issue and the second question is how do we address how do we address the gaming addiction to the extent um, that what we are advocating on fostering these practices so far those are the two questions that we have um, our panelists feel free to jump in and and answer the question while I look for more questions. Um, from Mr. Anton and the rest of the panelists, uh, you can share your you can share you, your thoughts on this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judith, right? Yes. Okay. Um, I saw the question actually. I, I guess I saw two questions there. I answered one, but I was hoping to answer this publicly. Um, the issue Mohammed just raised is 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 not new. It's something a lot of us experience. Now there seems to be this conflict between what the real ethics of the profession says and the ethics in the practice of sports law. But there's something I mentioned during the course of my lecture that um, sports, you know, sports law is like any other aspect of business, where you have to find the politics of the business, where you also find the religion of the business, where the hustle is indeed very real when it comes to the business. You, you understand? Now, that I, yes, I said that all these, um, the, especially those in the business of sports, those, those who are in the business of manufacturing sports and um, products, seem to be moving faster than regulators. And I think that is where lawyers should come in to draw a line between ethics and the line after ethics. And those, the line actually is not, is, is a very, it's a very thin line. But when I gave example with what happened in, um, in the swim, in the shark swimsuits and what happened in the case of Elid Kipchoge, I think the lesson we should take home from there is that we have to, find a way to advise our clients in such a way that they won't be they won't be breaking the law you know because we have found ourselves at, at a very difficult position where we, we we have to put the ethics of the profession i am not saying we should put the ethics of protection the ethics of the profession on the line but the 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 the, the whole idea is not to it's not to break the law <clears throat> Technology advancement and innovation, the extent we can use them is still, is still very, is still very vague. Most times they happen first before regulators take steps. So in, in also advising your client, you must make sure that they don't break extant rules. Once they don't break extant rules, and it's something that can give them advantage, and you know if it's not something that could give them a very it's not going to give them an unfair advantage aside the existing rules. We can we can do that. I don't see anything wrong with that. The, the, the person who advised Kipchoke to use the value fly, nothing happened, nothing happened. The athletics association just, just came out with some, with some rules and the value fly Nike issues fitted into it. So there was no reason to, to penalize um, Kipchoke. However, in, terms, in, in regards to the alpha fly, he was penalized. So it's, it's something we have to be very careful about. And to be very careful about it, we need to be abreast of new policies from regulators to know how we can advise. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Anthony. Uh, any other panels who would love to add um, additional comments before I jump into the, probably the last two question on the chat. Yes, yes. for Pablo, I could add on um, on the question of uh, addiction, uh, the addiction and um, and probably the gaming and uh, that is surrounding technology and sport. 
for the addiction, it's supposed to be really, uh, it varies uh, depending on the national regulators. Now, uh, at least many of the company, many of the countries have uh, gaming regulatory boards. So these ones are the ones that are responsible for sensitizing the masses on these addictions because they are real and also regulating the nature of ads that are put across by gaming companies and sports companies. Uh, that, that includes warnings of the addictiveness of these and also doing corporate responsibility to ensure that uh, the masses are aware of, of not only the benefits, but also the dangers that are, uh, that are involved in, uh, in gaming, and sport, uh, uh, gaming and technology. But it's, uh, at the moment, it's just hard to deal with it. And probably that's where the ethics come in. So it may not be uh, purely the law, but the ethics that come in and the best that they can do is really sensitizing the masses. And uh, the, uh, that is by the, those who put out those products. And then where a country has a gaming or regulatory board, I know it's there in Uganda, it's there in Kenya, it's there in, um, it's in, in Rwanda, I'm not sure about Tanzania, but those are the boards that are responsible for ensuring that we don't come uh, uh, addicted, addicted to these games in a manner that is dangerous ourselves or the public yes thank you so much timothy for the contribution and and before we we finalize i would love to have one last question um it's it's on on the legal, uh, the legal framework of the AI, uh, the question is: is how can we, how how can the invisible action in sport be regulated? I think uh, for some of the from the previous uh, presentation, this um, this has been cleared. And on my side, I would love to 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 have some clarification um, or a bit of a comment uh, to Ms. Aisha, uh, Leonard Council, Ms. Aisha, on the lack of legal framework. Now, the challenge that we have, I would, I would like to say it um, based in Tanzania, that most of uh, our, our sports act do not recognize or yes, do not recognize the, the the artificial intelligence or the any use of the or any use of a, of the AI. What will be the effect if um, if we have we we made we, we make a proposition of the of the act or of the laws that needs to regulate the AI? Will, will it be like we are heading, we are going back, going back and forth? Or um, I think, uh, yeah, even Peter, uh, Senior Council Peter will be able to add on that. And the dispute around that, are we, are we, are we knowledgeable enough to deal with the, with the thing on the internet, the AI? Because when we are talking about the AI, we are talking about an extra um, an extra mind that thinks fast, and it does, does not have the the human capability or the human feelings or the yes of of how to work around things. It is the algorithm around the making of it is in a way that it's hard to to compare with the human mind. Now, when it comes to dispute and the rest of uh, that will arise around that. Um, are we are, are we in a position um, legally to sustain that? Um, Peter and Miss Aisha, feel free to jump in. Uh, I just wanted to make sure I understood your question. Is your question that in the absence of laws? How do we bring disputes? Or was it another question? Maybe you can clarify. Yes, yes. Um, how do we do how how do we do that? Um, taking into account on on what you just said for um regarding Kenya, that someone brought uh um the 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 
preposition of the law before the parliament, but at the same time, I'm not so sure if the the national uh, the national sports act do acknowledge the or recognize um, AI in sport. Now, I'm just asking on the past on on the aspect of Tanzania. We are we do not have the preposition yet, but we are on that on that on on, on that aspect. Okay, so just to say we are like you in Tanzania because it is a draft bill. It is not specifically related to sports. In fact, all that the draft bill seeks to establish is that there should be a society called Robotics and AI Society of Kenya that is established that will then conduct research and advise the government on policy and things related to robotics and AI. So all it's asking for is that I think taxpayers fund a body to conduct research. It's not actually proposing any laws as such. Um, so in terms of sports and uh, sports disputes, they will have to, even, even without these laws in place and without a framework, people will still be able to bring uh, disputes uh, before sports tribunals and even before um, the normal courts, because the Constitution of Kenya of 2010 continues to apply and give everyone certain fundamental rights and freedoms. And some of those freedoms are like the right to human dignity, there's the right of access to justice, there's the right to the protection of personal data, there's the right to privacy and respect for your family, you know, life. These rights continue to apply even though in many areas we don't even have the laws. So the Data Protection Act came many years after the constitution was in force. But uh, the case law says that the, the right in the constitution took effect immediately the constitution was promulgated, even though the laws and the regulations about obtaining consent came later. So people will still be able to bring the dispute. And what will happen is when they are brought before like uh, courts, they will have to be submissions, I think, by legal experts about these issues. Because one of the points that was made earlier, I think by uh, Mr. Tata, is the fact that lawyers need to become much more tech technologically aware and follow developments. Because these are very technical areas. And I would think that for these type of disputes around uh, misuse of AI and discrimination and things like that, they would need expert evidence. And those experts will not be lawyers. Those experts will be the ones in that field um, who can explain to a court exactly what is going on. So I, I hope that uh, helps a little bit. Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, um, Peter, or Senior Counsel Peter, can you please unmute and and if you can answer the question, we have like uh, two minutes. Yes, I'm not very far from uh, what Aisha has uh, said. Uh, and uh, in my brief presentation, I also hinted on the issue of human rights. And that is a key point uh, which needs to be safeguarded or protected. Uh, given the fact from experience in Tanzania, it's quite a, a, a new different stuff. We do understand we have the robotics in the society, which is now struggling. Uh, and uh, if I draw my experience from uh, the time when I was uh, in the idea and the time when I came to establish it, Esport Federation. Uh, the, the, there were some issues which we uh, were left behind, and uh, given the fact that our National Sports uh, Act dated back 1976, I think. So it all talks about physical sports, and uh, most of uh, artificial intelligence are not uh, within. So, uh, drawing the inference from what Aisha said, uh, and the, this is also an uh, opportunity to come and support lawyers uh, to, to, to take advantage and uh, to enlighten on the 
artificial intelligence uh, IP uh, that we are here to fill now the gap. Because as you understand uh, from the, even the, the artificial intelligence regulation uh, for European Union, it has now taken for almost 10 years. Uh, so this thing cannot come easily. Uh, we, we, we should now fill the gap. And the, the key point is on the human rights protection and the safeguard. That should be a, 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 should be the key point. Uh, and uh, uh, you, you have hinted about Tanzania. I think you have talked about Tanzania. It is an advantage and it is also, uh, uh, you know, it's Kenyan society, which is more uh, litigant uh, and uh, is always uh, there to protect the, the, the uh, the, the constitution and the, 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 the um, uh, I mean the, the constitution of, of Kenya is quite different from Tanzania where uh, it is not a litigant society uh, but uh, as I spoke earlier that is the, the gap which we need to fill and uh, I've also led some some um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the enacted uh, sports uh, uh, act of Uganda, it also have left some, some, some issues concerning uh, artificial intelligence. So those are the areas I think we as lawyers, we need now to, to fill the gap and I take that as opportunity. Thank you so much, um, Senior Council Peter, for your for, for your remark. Um, before we we end our session for today, um, allow me to welcome um, the panelists to have a final remark before we close it. Um, Philip, if you allow me. Philip, are you are you are you still here with us? Yes, Judith. Now, okay, thank you. So, before we wind up, um, let's have a, a final remark from the from the panelists and and how and end our session for today. Um, Doctor Emmanuel. Yes, thank you. I'm here. Um, can can we have a two minute closing remark? Thank um, you. Well, one more time again, let me appreciate the organizer for this platform and for everyone coming on board. Thank you for coming. As we wrap up, I just think wants to uh, harmonize on the whole essence of this webinar that the, the webinar from the what the organizer sent seek to. Uh, create awareness of artificial intelligence in the sport industry. And having listened to all the presenters and my own presentation, I think I'd like to just add again, because somebody asked, so I said, what is the, uh, our, as lawyers, which area are we looking at? Uh, there are seven issues that came up because of this presentation that I will highlight again. Number one, issues of human rights, Number two, issues of data and privacy violation. Number three, issues of fairness. Number four, issues of sport governance, accountability and transparency. Number five, issues of policy formulation. They're talking about giving legal opinion as number six and contract drafting as number seven. And then finally, maybe I should add issues of patent, trademark and copyright. These are the eight areas, uh, broad, broadly speaking, that as lawyers, we come into the issue of artificial intelligence in the sport industry. One more time, I do thank the organizer for bringing me on board and thanking everyone for creating time to be part of this webinar. Thank you, Aisha Adam. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Judith, I'm done.
Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Imano. Um, Mr. Anthony, can you please give us your your remarks? Then um, Ms. Aisha will follow. Then Timothy, Mr. Peter, and Philip. Okay, thank you very much. My closing remark will be this. For all my colleagues who are here from across the continent who are attending, be rest assured that sports law is an area of competence where you can build your practice, earn a living, and be successful. Now, Africa is, a, is still a gold mine for the practice of sports law. So the advice I would give to many of us, you know, to if you want to get started, or if you still want to enhance your skills or your area of competence, there are, there are more than 30 sports in the Olympics. There are more than 30 sports people play that require services of lawyers. Coincidentally, from the part of Africa where I come from, football seems to be the only 90% of sports lawyers are doing football. And I know it's like that you know, in, in, across the continent. But we can choose football. We can choose two other sports. We can choose cycling. We can choose athletics. We can choose rugby, cricket, tennis. We can choose table tennis and begin to build competence in that aspect of law. We can choose two, three of them, you know, depending on where you come from in, 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 on the part of the continent. You build your knowledge on it, follow what regulators are doing in that industry, follow everything that is doing, the, the um, technology innovations, make sure you follow them, read up on them, subscribe to newsletters. If, if there are resources, attend conferences or seminars on them. And I can tell you, if, if we continue to press like this, you will see what will turn out to be. We will build, we'll build, a, we'll build a, a pool of, of, of professionals and experts in sports law in Africa. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very, very much, my co-panelists, Aisha, Peter, um, Dr. Manuel, Timothy. Thank you very much. P Philip. Yes, Mr. Adata. Thank you, so much, Mr. Atata. Um, a word uh, from Ms. Aisha before Peter and Timoth uh, take over. Uh, thank you. Just to reiterate that um, there's a huge space for lawyers to operate um, in uh, disputes. And as much as we said some of these issues are technical, I, I don't think that should uh, stop uh, people getting involved in the field because the legal issues I raised about data protection, human rights, fairness, these are not, uh, these are not novel and they are not new and they are not technical. Uh, a lawyer would be equipped to understand those issues and a lawyer is able to bring in as experts as needed to assist. So I would not want people to be put off because they think there's a very high barrier to entry. I think the thing is you must first have a genuine interest in sports. And if you have a genuine interest in sports, you're very likely to follow the controversies and the trends and you'll find it easy. So I would just like to encourage everyone to get involved because I think what we are lacking is uh, we don't have enough African sports lawyers at all. Yes, um, that's very true, um, Ms. Aisha. We do not have enough sports lawyer in East Africa. And I think with the platform that we have, um, with the session that ELS is um, preparing for us, I'm sure we'll have more. Um, a word from uh, P Wakili Peter, then uh, Timothy, get ready. A final remark, just one minute or two. Yeah, for me, I, I appreciate uh, the, the organizers and uh, the panelists for the well insight on artificial intelligence. But the message to lawyers and the coming, uh, upcoming sport lawyers, the, the space in the room is so big uh, and the waters. Uh, and so Anton has said, uh, 
there are a lot of uh, premises in sport, uh, and the key uh, the key aspect should be passion. One need to have passion, and uh, as what as Aisha has advised, uh, we are still very few, and uh, going through the, the FIFA reports on transfers, uh, it is actually surprising when you see a lot of agents, a lot of lawyers uh, uh, from Europe uh, taking charge on our African aspects. So we still have a lot to do and uh, we still have a lot to, to encourage uh, the coming lawyers uh, to, to venture on uh, sports law. Uh, and uh, whenever you have time and chances like this, I also encourage people to come on our, on our side of the eSport where we have a lot of opportunities. And uh, eSport also cut you closely on uh, uh, different issues. And uh, the ecosystem behind it is uh, robust. Uh, and the, the artificial intelligence is at the helm of this sport. Uh, so I encourage uh, uh, lawyers, uh, young lawyers who are coming to field, the pool is still uh, narrow and uh, we need to fill the gap. And uh, uh, the experience in East Africa, uh, the practice is still uh, uh, very narrow and uh, we have a lot to do and this platform uh, could also be one of the the tool to, to encourage and uh, pushing people now to venture in this possible. That's all from my side. Um, thank you so much. Um, Timothy? Uh, thanks, uh, Judith. Really, from my end, uh, my seniors have said it all. Uh, the space is virgin, and I would like uh, us all to put in the hours, in addition to the passion, put in the hours, put in the work, uh, read the reports, read the rules across the, the different sports disciplines. Uh, if, if you can't even, you can't even take the FIFA agency exam, be interested in the field and uh, put in the hours. And when you're coming on board or on your way to, uh, to, to these platforms, don't only have a national perspective, good enough, this is um, at regional level, but uh, this practice is one that you can do uh, across, across, across the borders. I can sit here and file a case before FIFA, have my win without leaving the country, without, without struggling. So, even as you come in, don't only focus uh, in your, uh, at uh, national level, Come in with an international perspective, keep the passion, and put in the hours. Uh, that is it for me. Thank you so much, um, Timothy. And to the rest of the uh, to the rest of the uh, of the panelists, Dr. Emmanuel, Mr. Anton, um, Miss Aisha. Uh, Wakili Peter and Timothy, thank you very much for taking your time. And before I say uh, goodbye, I would like to take a note on what uh, Mr. Anthony said, Africa is a gold mine in sport and opportunity for lawyers is, is there. So I would like to encourage everybody um, to get more involved, learn more about the, learn more about the the industry, and 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 let's be 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 the lead on this. Um, without uh, further ado, I would like to again invite you all. Um, we are we will be having our women in sport conference, so it's another another opportunity, another platform for you, uh, for the lawyers to join in. Um, on the on the other aspect of women in sport on how to to go around the women industry. I know it's very, it's growing very fast. So feel free to come, which will be in Zanzibar in June. 
and you're all welcome. So before I, I wind up, I would like to welcome um, Philip to, to finalize the, the session, the webinar. I'm sure we have all learned a lot. It, it, it has been very, very, very productive. And once again, thank you again for your active participation um, and your valuable contribution um, throughout the webinar. Philip, if you can take over from now. Philip. Um, okay, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Judith, and our esteemed panelists. We cannot thank you enough. Uh, we appreciate sharing your insights with us, and uh, we are really grateful to our participants and the panelists will be sharing out uh, certificates of attendance and of participation to you. And this will be done in the course of the coming week. Otherwise, we thank you so much for all the effort and for being very good uh, participants in this session. Be on the lookout for our sessions in the coming week. Next week, we'll be uh, discussing cross-border finance, and we will also look at private wealth management. Do not miss out on this very uh, informative sessions. Otherwise, uh, from us, we wish you all a very blessed afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day until we meet again. Goodbye.